Museum of Christian Art in conversation with Geta Pandit, a claim writer and heritage activist of Goa. They will be taking us through the ages about a monument that has stood the test of time, the Convent of Santa Monica, located on the holy hill in Old Goa. Easily recognizable by the flying buttresses, this was Asia's first and largest convent, now an educational institute for nuns and home to the Museum of Christian Art. I would now like to introduce our speakers. Natasha Fernandez is from Goa and has worked at the Museum of Christian Art since 2007 as the curator. With over 15 years of experience, she has been involved in every aspect of the museum, including the conservation of the collection, visitor engagement, and organizing special events. She was awarded a scholarship by Kalus Kurenkin Foundation and Moka, Goa, to attend a nine-month training program in various aspects of museum management in Lisbon, Portugal from 2006 to 2007. Natasha also promotes the museum and surrounding monuments on the Holy Hill in Old Goa through curated walks. Keta Pandit is the founding member of the Goa Heritage Action Group. She came to Goa in 1995 and has been writing on heritage ever since. She has written nine books and is currently working on Grinding Stories Volume 2 and a translation of Mrs. Purnima Kefir's book, Vismurtichya Umpartyavar, on the forgotten domestic objects of Goa. The Museum of Christian Art, Sikh Cathedral, Basilica of Go Shizu, Church and Convent of Santa Monica, and many other churches and convents around Old Goa hold a treasure trove of some of the finest works of art in Goa. Through a presentation of art objects and murals, which continue to adorn the walls and ceilings of many of these monuments in Goa, Keta Pandit and Natasha Fernandez highlight the invaluable contribution of local artisans, builders, and artists in the execution of these works of art. Before we begin, allow me to go over some house rules. Please keep your phones on silent or airplane mode during the talk, following which there will be a short QA. We hope that you will engage all hearts. And with that, can we have an round of applause welcoming the speakers? Please. somebody to define a spiral staircase. How do they define it? Like this. And when you speak about the convent of Santa Monica, they always describe the convent as the flying buttresses. So this is a monumental building located in Old Goa, but away from the tourist circuit. And with this presentation, we intend to invite you and become ambassadors to the Museum of Christian Art. Please bring your friends, family, and visitors to Goa after, uh, after you hear us speak and tell you stories from the convent and the Museum of Christian Art. This is a bird's eye view or a drone's eye view of the convent. It was once Asia's largest convent, housing 100 nuns. The first foundation stone was laid with great manfred with roses and jasmine spread on the pathway and uh, a big procession. 21 nuns were housed here for the first time and in fact, quite by coincidence, the, that foundation stone was laid on the 2nd of July, a date when I landed in Goa 27 years ago and a date when Natasha joined Mokka 15 years ago. So I don't know what to do. Your point is that we just realized that while we were reading uh, an interesting yeah. essay a few days back. Uh, but so much that we are always learning about uh, this building and it is always, uh, I don't know, exciting us. I've been there for 15 years every day in and out of the building and I'm learning every day. So here today in, in maybe uh, 40 minutes or uh, an hour, I don't know how much. Of, uh, of this information we can share, but we'll do our little best. So, uh, moving on from the bird's eye view, this is the uh, plaque here. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the plaque laid on the 3rd of September, when the convent building was actually expanded from that initial uh, first uh, smaller building which housed 21 nuns. So, there are many of these plaques on the facade of the building. 
So this being the foundation stone, there are others uh, around the portals of the entrances to the church and the main convent as well. This convent was built during the reign of Philip the Third. Uh, Spanish ruling uh, had control even over Portugal during that time, so it was uh, built during the reign of actually Philippians in, uh, from Spain. And this convent got royal patronage, so there was royal patronage that was used for this convent, the building as well as the looking after of the convent for several years. This is a space that you will not normally have access to. This is the, the these are the corridors and to the left and uh, on the right you will see the, a very large, very, uh, very expansive courtyard. Now you must remember that these were cloistered nuns. They had no access to the outside world once they entered the convent. They were very strict rules. Some of the nuns, once they entered, never left the convent. Some of the nuns used to voluntarily take vows of silence, not even speaking to one another within the convent. The, and the rules were decided by the Archbishop of Goa at that time and they, what they did was they had very strict rules on what was allowed and what was not allowed. So when they entered the convent, they brought all their wealth, their lands, their ornaments, their jewellery, their, uh, their clothes and, and guess what else they could have brought besides all these things. Any guesses? Seeds. Sorry? Seeds. Hmm? Seeds. Seeds. What a good, what a good answer. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> yes, they probably uh, brought seeds because they grew vegetables of, uh, for their own use. And what else? Recipes. 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 Wonderful. Lots of prayers. And they were allowed one uh, idol or one icon like a baby Jesus and so on to bring <coughs> with them of their own for their own personal use. And they also brought with them servants and slaves to help with the convent. So fine, uh, at last count, we don't know how many there were finally. We, we are saying 100 nuns, but there must have been a lot more people living in this convent. And it, it, uh, they were allowed three things only to occupy themselves, embroidery, darning and stitching. They were not allowed to do anything else. Cooking. Okay also of course they had <laughs> and uh, had to spend a lot of their time of course in prayer and med meditation uh, we we think that they were involved to an extent in the gardens hmm. uh, in, uh, using their time in the gardens but also the produce that was grown in the gardens and the surrounding areas around the convent was then sold in the local markets by the by the slaves who went out who, who could go out they were the ones who could go out and and make the sale of uh, of the produce that was grown in the in the compound of the convent but they also earned revenue from the properties that they brought in as dowry so uh, so how if i was a cloistered nun and i wasn't didn't have any contact with anybody in the outside world how would i get the monies that, that were accrued to me what do you think happened i had managers who were managing the plantations outside they were uh, plucking the coconuts and uh, so on and how would they give me the money then if i if they had no access to me any guesses Mother's over here. <laughs> good one clive inside she was inside in man, why does the man, why does the man need any money if the government is taking care of her ah good question. Yeah, to run the convent. So the, so the, and, the, and so the people taking care of the convent would uh, have yeah, access to her yeah, money, right? Yeah. She may then in turn give it to uh, for the convent upkeep, but the land still belonged to her. The managers also, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 communicated with, with her individually. What they had was a turntable. So if I had to, if uh, somebody was managing my property, I had to give some papers or monies or some transaction had to be done. I would put it, the manager would put it in my cubicle and turn the table 
and I would be at the other end, a cloistered nun, and I would take it from my niche, and I would look at the papers, the documents, or the monies that, are, that so were due to me. So, uh, the lady who's a nun, can she send money back home to take care of her uh, extended family? We, uh, we haven't come across that. And uh, just one request, if you could uh, reserve your questions okay. to the okay. end of, yeah. Okay. Thank you for your interjection. But uh, we might lose the train of thought. <laughs> Now the, uh, yeah, go, go. the convent is full of paintings like this, absolutely stunning. And this is the only picture or, or done on the wall, fresco, that we see uh, of the Trinity, the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, done directly on the walls in what we call our secret chapel in the convent. And uh, that's the only one we see, at least we have seen so far, that has human forms. Yes, yeah, so this is a very, very unique uh, depiction of the Holy Trinity in the human form and uh, the only difference that you see, of course, slight variations in the features, but the symbols which are on their, uh, on their, around their chest is what identifies God the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. They, uh, we have references to say that they were inspired by Flemish paintings, but the artists were local. Uh, who worked on these on these uh, murals in the convent, in the church, uh, and in the surrounding spaces? <laughs> this is just like overwhelming, completely stunning. We still haven't unravelled the, the the narratives behind these paintings. Perhaps these stories were from the Old Testament, but they don't. Uh, no, yeah. this one in this case. Yes, yeah. we know what the narrative is. The some others we have not yet not. unraveled. Uh, so in this in this particular scene, this is on the ceiling of the chapel, which we call our own Sistine Chapel. Uh, you have the angel Gabriel appearing in one uh, part of this pain, uh, entire ceiling. Angel Gabriel appears to Saint Joseph and to the Virgin Mary. So there's just in the angel Gabriel just once in the painting and she's appeared to both of them simultaneously in this one yeah when she's uh, telling joseph in his dream what's going to happen next and to the virgin mary there is the nativity scene here there is the scene of john the baptist lifting <coughs> baby jesus and there is the flight to egypt in that corner there so uh, a lot of uh, Jesus' early life from before he was born till his early life is depicted all at once in this painting on the ceiling of the chapel of the Trinity in the convent. Uh, like Heta has already mentioned, uh, I don't know whether you mentioned, the convent today you don't have access to this convent because it is run as an institute for nuns who come from all over India to study. So public don't have access to this space. Uh, so this presentation in fact is a, is a way of us throwing light into the treasures of the convent. Uh, once a year the Museum of Krishnanat organizes a walk uh, through the convent so visitors or people from the community get a chance to have a glimpse of what the convent looks like. This is the old uh, refractory. And all the female saints that must have been popular in 17th, 18th century, this must have been done over many, many years by perhaps by different uh, artists. But this is the ceiling of that refectory, and it's the most beautiful thing you could ever lay your hands on, or uh, sorry, eyes on. Uh, all the female saints with their names are there on this uh, ceiling. So since we are uh, sharing stories about the convent, uh, here is another one. This is a miracle that happened uh, in the church space of the convent. So the church was dedicated to Saint Mary and uh, there was this image of Christ on an altar which when the nuns were once praying they saw this image open his eyes and through the wound marks blood was seen flowing. So this happened in 1636 in the month of February and it was noticed by the nuns and then it was communicated to the Archbishop 
at that time and again this miracle happened on the 12th of february and it was documented as a miracle and uh, uh, many people started coming into this space to pray to this image of christ now you will say but the convent is close to the public how did the people come in the convent uh, the church was accessible by the by the community uh, the rest of the convent was not so while the people would come in and use the church space the nuns had a separate area that is the choir area from where they participated in the mass okay so we as natasha mentioned cooking <coughs> and has anybody here who's never eaten bibinka leave the room immediately we need to eat it so we have a special treat for you uh, i don't know where it is at the end at, at the, the end, end of the okay. talk okay <laughs> treat at the end and um, bibinka uh, was first uh, i think made here that's uh, in the convent of santa monica it uh, it is all there's a similar dish in malaysia indonesia it could be that one of the slaves of the servants also shared this recipe with the nuns earlier it was made with the milk of almonds and now today it's made with the milk of coconut and um, uh, what uh, this is named after sister bibiana so um, like eva said it must have been inspired from um, a uh, recipe from another country but here they adapted it and used the local ingredients to make the bibinka and named it after sister bibiana so it's a seven layered cake <laughs> which we've all eaten at some point <laughs> okay this is the entrance to the museum of christian art so from the stories of the convent i'll take you to the to the museum of christian art which was set up in 1994 in the seminary of rashol in south goa the museum moved to this convent space in 2002 uh, because old goa was more visible and a center for uh, tourist activities and would have better footfalls from what we were receiving in rashol when the museum moved here into this beautiful space of the convent we had just the choir area which was given to us to use as the museum and the choir area was um, completely dilapidated this some talking about 2001 yeah so 22 years ago but was uh, was restored to a certain extent at that point uh, by the committee and the architects who were involved and the museum of christian art accommodated within that space i will take you through the collection and then talk a little more about the the space most of us have most of you have visited the museum i think how many of you have not visited the museum yet okay all right so even for those of you who have visited the museum and may have seen this object or may not have seen this object like the name suggests it's a chalice and pattern the christian art collection that we have is unique because we highlight the indian influences in this christian art these were made right from the 16th century till the 20th century for the churches of goa but who made them were they the portuguese artists were they other european missionaries who came along uh, during that time who made this no it was the local artists who were commissioned to make these objects for the church use so whether they were liturgical vessels like this chalice and pattern or textiles that were used in the church or paintings that were used in the church all of these were made by local artists who existed in goa and the surrounding areas so what is one indian element that you can tell me is here yeah. the bearer thank you this is a very interesting uh, little reliquary coffer like a little chest uh, in silver and wood and it has uh, st francis xavier something related to st francis xavier connected to his life the miracles that he performed on either side of this box when you come into the museum space you get a better uh, view of 
what this box uh, looks like but what it contained was at one time a piece of a vestment of St. Francis Xavier. So it says here, this is the back of the box, it says So Pelis Don San Francisco Xavier. So it's uh, the inscription on the back of the box. Two angels that are also depicted here and the logo of the of the Society of Jesus IHS. Okay, the name is uh, a long name, it's a tabernacle, of course a tabernacle uh, is a receptacle in which we keep the small hosts which are distributed during communion in the mass and a monstrance. Now, while I can tell you more about this when you come into the museum, let me tell you a little more about how interesting this piece is. It's one of its kind in the whole world because usually a monstrance looks very different from this one. Here it takes on the shape of a bird. The bird is meant to be a pelican and why a pelican because the pelican is believed to feed her babies from a pouch in which she stores food but in the process sometimes when she's feeding her babies her babies peck on that uh, thin membrane like pouch and uh, it gets damaged and sometimes the pelican bleeds to them so this is the, uh, the sacrificial element was used in medieval Christian art to compare to Christ. So that's why the pelican bird here takes on the form of the monstrance and she is perched on a globe which symbolizes the world and that is actually the tabernacle. You can see one part behind which is the door. Very slight uh, thing in the back which is the door for the tabernacle. It's a monumental piece and uh, really the showstopper in our museum. Uh, but very, very interesting and fascinating stories. It was originally made for the convent of Santa Monica in the 17th century. When the convent was abandoned in the later part of the 19th century, uh, when it ceased to be a cloistered convent, this uh, tabernacle monstrance was relocated to the cathedral, which was the seat and the parish, uh, the seat of the archbishop and the, and the parish church of uh, Old Goa. And it was when the museum was set up, it was moved to the museum. So it actually came back home. Natasha, uh, does it look like a pelican? No. no. What does the head look like? Garuda. Huh? Garuda or peacock? Peacock. Because that is what the craftspeople, the local craftsmen, were familiar with. There are no references of a pelican. Another interesting piece from the collection is this beautiful painting of the virgin and child and it's framed in a multi layer frame so it's got four four frames in uh, four different types of frames and the last the outermost one is done in filigree and the painting itself it's a painting on paper uh, from the 17th century and it has some resemblances to the Mughal miniature style of painting, this particular one. The infant Jesus, Saviour of the world, again in silver. And uh, if you look at the vestment that this infant Jesus is wearing in the embroidery on the vestment, it is very similar to the Zardozi style of embroidery that was done, is done even till today. And uh, the image itself has very, uh, very sharp features and uh, as if the infant is speaking to you. This particular one of course is meant to depict the saviour of the world. If you look at the base of this, you can't really see it very clearly here. Again, the trick is to get you to the museum to look at all these Indian elements. There are these half human, half coiled body like that of snakes, which after studying for a long time, art historians who uh, have uh, been studying Indo-Portuguese art have called these Nagas. Now, Nagas are Hindu divinities, Hindu sacred divinities and start to feature in church altars, in furniture, in uh, objects of art which were used in the church right from the 16th century and here we see them as well in this base of this uh, infant Jesus sculpture.
VMA. Not from the museum of Victoria and Albert. These were cruets which were containers to hold wine and water because they are not transparent containers. Um, I think to facilitate and make it easier for the priest to know which one has wine and which one has water, the artist must have added on the alphabet. But if you look at the handles of these cruets, it's a snake. And when you imagine the lid opening, it's like the hood of the cobra. This is one of my most favorite pieces. Uh, if you asked a sculptor to do this today, even from a one piece of ivory, and he did this, you would probably reject it. Because infant Jesus is so big, huge, compared to Mary Magdalene at the base of the statue. But this was done for a purpose. This is infant Jesus as the good shepherd. You've got the lambs there, also disproportionate. You have the uh, elixir of life or water of life flowing into a bowl and you have a whole composition. Now Jesus is not, does not look like a shepherd. He looks like a prince and he looks very much like Lord Krishna to me. Like Heta mentioned, this is carved out of a single piece of ivory and uh, very very detailed carving and it, you can see the dimensions it's only 15 centimeters in height another uh, favorite among the visitors who come to the museum is this infant jesus in um, in a canopy bed and let me share with you what they tell me they tell me ye to hamara bal krishna hai so, um, some strong resemblances to baby Krishna. Infant Jesus uh, was made as uh, in this form to be given to the bride by her mother uh, as part of her trousseau in the hope that she would have a baby soon and she would have a baby, baby boy. boy soon. Uh, so, that was why these infant Jesuses were made and I am sure when the um, artist who was making it and then it was given handed over to the goldsmith for adornments he must have thought of krishna and then made this little bed also to go with it also depending on who was commissioning the work yeah if they were able to afford the bed and the, the ornamentation for the baby jesus <laughs> now this uh, look at the lotus at the base of this statue and uh, the sari clad uh, Mother Mary, but uh, why is she not Saraswati and why is she Mother Mary? We call her Nirmala Mata. She's got a Holy Spirit symbol on her forehead and a crescent moon at the bottom. Now this statue in ivory was anonymously left in Father Loyola, uh, Loyola's uh, room at the seminary in Pune. So we don't know the provenance or the origins of this statue, but uh, we've given the name. Father, 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 Father has given them. So when I mentioned to you the Nagas in the earlier sculpture, here we see the Nagas uh, as the support for this beautiful uh, inlaid cabinet chest. If we visit some of the older churches in Goa and we go to the sacristy spaces, you will see large chests of drawers in our churches that were meant to store vestments and other textiles that were used in the church. This is one of those examples from the basilica and inlay work. Now inlay work was learnt by the uh, local artists and craftsmen when uh, in the 17th century 16th century, uh, the missionaries were invited to the court of Akbar for religious dialogues, the Jesuit missionaries. They took along with them the local uh, artisans, craftsmen, who learnt this inlay technique from their counterparts in uh, Mughal, India. Mughal India 
and then introduced it in our church furniture and even our home furniture uh, of that period had inlay work. So you have inlay work, you have the nagas and you have the form which is a European form, it's a chest of drawers which was very popular and much used in Europe during that period. You want to say? Uh, just, uh, um, this sort of work is called intarsia, I-N-T-A-R-S-I-A, where wood of another kind is inlaid into uh, wood, uh, the, the background wood. And the other thing I want to say, if you visited Trigredo House at Rotoli, you will see samples of similar furniture there. This is an example of a vestment uh, that was used in the past by, by the priests and uh, it has uh, floral elements, it has a pineapple as well in the center. The pineapple, while it has a strong Christian uh, from uh, the Latin Americas, from uh, South America and uh, from Brazil, from the documents that we have referred to, it was brought to Goa and uh, to this entire region. And uh, then, we, it, of course, it's a symbol of uh, wealth and uh, eternity. eternity. And it starts to feature on not only our vestments and textiles, but also became a symbol in many other places. Like we came across a reference to it. Uh, used in the Golgumbaj in Golconda also. So how the pineapple after traveling from another part of the world got integrated here and is grown in abundance in, in India now. So why why is it a symbol of eternity? Any guesses? Yes, brilliant. So you cut the, you, after you eat the fruit, you cut the top off and it grows back. So that's a symbol of um, eternity. That's why pineapple. And even in our secret chapel, what, in the convent, we have many, 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 many uh, paintings of pineapples with various birds on them. The other thing in the secret chapel is the kind of flowers and botanical specimens that have been painted. So some of the nuns, I'm sure, or the artists at least, were very, very well versed with botany. A processional banner, what is so special? Uh, banners are used during processions in our uh, church festivities and this particular one is dedicated to the confraternity of St. Joseph. So you can see in the center of this banner, St. Joseph and Child Jesus. What is so interesting about this particular banner is the ivory work on the textile. So the face and the hands of baby Jesus and Saint Joseph are in ivory. Now ivory work on textiles uh, like this in this form is uh, very very unique to, to Goa. This is the other side of the banner. Again there is uh, the Virgin Mary and her face and her hands are also in ivory. When you come into the museum uh, earlier, uh, the display was such that you could see only one side. Now also you can see one side clearly, but if you stand at an angle, you can see the other side as well. So you can appreciate both sides of the banner. So the museum uh, has been there at the convent of Santa Monica since 2002. And uh, we were in the choir area of the church. That's the area that we <coughs> occupied. and. Uh, The church was also in need of, uh, of restoration. At some point in the 1950s, uh, all these monuments like the, like the convent of Santa Monica and many others were cement plastered. And uh, it's a problem with all structures which have cement. It, it uh, has a lot of problems. And it's a bad marriage. <laughs> And it was decided, uh, the committee at that time felt that, you know, we needed to do something and get this uh, church space restored. And the monument, the Convent of Santa Monica is a state protected monument. So the museum prepared a proposal for the restoration of the church and took it to the state archaeology department who 
uh, in, were very encouraged by the proposal and uh, we took up the restoration of the church where we de-plastered the cement walls and re-plastered with the traditional mudline plaster. Also we uh, restored, opened the roof, checked the beams uh, and replaced whatever was damaged. So this is one of those uh, images that show you the work that was done. So there was civil works and there was art restoration. For the art restoration, we had two Portuguese conservators along with the Pico team. Now Pico is a, a family that has been doing church art restoration for many for many decades and for fourth Great. generations. For uh, Glenn and Nixon are the fourth generation who are actively involved along with their parents, along with their father in the uh, conservation and restoration of this church. This is what it looks like today. Not to say we don't have problems today, we still continue to have problems, but we've come a long way. We have uh, issues with the monsoons, we have tiles moving, we have leakage, we have seepage, but we try our level best to attend to these problems. But the major restoration that happened between 2011 and 2016 was full of discoveries. Can you see the flow? So in the 1950s, it, uh, they must have laid a red oxide cement flow, which was what how we found it in a very damaged condition. And we knew we had to take off the red oxide flooring, but we did not know what we would put once we have taken that out. But when we started to open up little windows on the floor, just to see what lay beneath, we found a near perfect stone floor from the 17th century and that's how we left it. It's a little uneven but we felt that we didn't want to make a, put a new flow in, in, in place of the stone flow. This is also one of the discoveries under all that lime plaster, layers and layers of lime plaster done by several people for I don't know how many years. We discovered graffito or uniquely Goan art called Kavi. Kavi art, if I'll just take a minute to explain, is done or directly on the walls to, to define sacred spaces. It's uh, done in temples, churches, and also in homes to define a sacred space. What happens is the line is uh, the wall is plastered first, the uh, design is etched out and filled with carb, which is red soil finely sipped to a fine flour-like powder mixed with a binding agent and charcoal to arrest the decay and filled in. So if you touch kavi anywhere, you will feel like a, uh, it's a textured uh, surface. It's also done the other way around, where a larger piece uh, of the wall is done in red and then the white is etched out and filled in with lime plaster. So this is one of the most exciting discoveries. Uh, you'll see it if you go come to the museum and to the church. So the, the parts of the church which were cement plastered, we have lost the kavi. Where there was, uh, maybe it was hidden under wooden panels which were taken out for restoration, that's where we discovered the original kavi. Some places we uh, restored but not with the traditional uh, style, we've done it with a stencil. So near the main altar you will see a stencil and you'll also see parts of the original kavi. I think this one I'll just speak. So this is uh, the the image of the weeping cross that we had shown you earlier, the miraculous image of the, uh, it's actually the bleeding cross but as the story was told orally, it became known as the weeping cross and it's today popular, popular and it, you know, it draws people, they come looking for the weeping cross. So this is the, the altar which uh, the conservators worked on this image for a long time and also on the, uh, the entire altar, the canopy of the altar, they found the original colours that had been painted over and a lot of time and effort was put into the uh, restoration of this particular altar. Another painting, that uh, a panel painting in the church, just to show you the conservation efforts and uh, the transformation that happens uh, once you conserve. Sometimes it's just simple interventions of taking off 
the layers of dirt and dust from many centuries and it just transforms uh, the whole painting. But sometimes bad restoration can also be, do more harm in the sense not only damage the painting but completely change the expression of the subjects. Again a discovery during the, the conservation and restoration of this church. So there was a wooden pulpit, uh, a beautiful one from the 18th century and uh, we had to take it down for restoration. And as we started to take down panel after panel of this pulpit, we discovered the original. Can you see on the, on your right? Yeah, yeah the stone pulpit came alive and a mural around the stone pulpit. And this was the restoration. So we didn't really go deep into excavating the path that originally the priest must have used to access the pulpit because we don't need to do it anymore. And also we were worried about the stability of the structure. But we have um, retained the original. The wooden pulpit, before I get the question, is in parts, it's been kept in the convent and hopefully we'll be able to restore it but not put it back in this place. We have to find another location to display it, maybe in the same church space but another location not covering this. As an exhibition piece. As so this is one uh, example of how the church space is used today. We used it for the opening uh, of the uh, opening event of the museum, but many of you have come to this church space for concerts and uh, the Ketevan concert and even the Carols of the Hill at Moka. So we use the church space for concerts, exhibitions, lectures, workshops, and it becomes an extension of the museum. The museum uh, went through a major upgradation in 2017 and uh, we changed the whole display, the setup, the museology, the and the conservation of the objects. Our main concern was with the structural uh, problems that the building was facing with leakages and dampness and the conservation of the pieces. So we got in uh, the Gulbenkian team with their technical expertise helped us to put up a proposal along with architect Arminio from Goa who uh, was the project consultant for this project who looked after the whole uh, structural restoration of the building and we brought in the team from Intact New Delhi. Intact is Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage. They have a wing that looks after conservation of uh, art objects who came in and were based at MOCA for 10 months and they cons conserved the entire collection. So we had, we all our objectives were met, we got a conserved collection, the structural restoration was done which has now made the museum um, to a large extent, 95% of the problems are resolved and a new layout which was so required for the museum to place the objects in a sort of a sequence where you understand the evolution of that particular art form. So you have ivories from the 16th century and then you see their evolution because they are all placed together. All the metals are placed together. So you can look at the evolution of the style of the metals, of the paintings. A very well thought of uh, museological plan and uh, you must come and see the, the new uh, layout of the museum. This is of course the cent central space which looks like it has nothing. When you enter the museum you will say where are all the uh, 150 odd objects. I can see only two. Uh, but as you enter in you will start to slowly discover uh, the, the hidden gems of the museum. And museums are changing all over the world. Now the concept is not to cram the museum with as many exhibits as possible and to give like paisa vasool kind of thing. but to make every object relate to the viewer. So when you come there, you'll see that you'll be able to form a sort of relationship with every object that you look at and, and listen to uh, the story of.